one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Trans Stories Through Gaming, a panel discussion hosted by Riot Games and the It Gets Better Project. My name is Brian Wenke. I am the Executive Director and CEO of the It Gets Better Project, leading the global storytelling effort to empower LGBTQ plus youth. I'm Jessica Nam, VP and Executive Producer of League of Legends, um, as well as the Executive Sponsor for Riot's LGBTQIA plus employee resource group, uh, Rainbow Rioters. Today is the International Trans Day of Visibility, a global event uh, held every March 31st that celebrates transgender and non-binary identity. The event itself is a push for positive trans visibility, but beyond that, it's also a push to turn that visibility into action that directly benefits the lives of trans people. In order to uh, contribute to that goal, Riot and It Gets Better have invited a panel of trans professionals working in the gaming industry to discuss a common goal why trans people must be given the space to tell their own stories and what resources the trans community needs in order to do so. Uh, we'll highlight some resources. Um, uh, we'll highlight some games that have done this well. I dive into the unique themes of self-told trans stories and envision a future of positive trans representation while acknowledging the state of the game industry today. We kind of see games as a forward-facing medium with accessibility for a new generation of diverse storytellers. Um, and that's because stories can offer a window into someone else's world, uh, a way to connect and create empathy for one another. And so by highlighting these stories, we want to encourage that connection for our audience. The trans community faces painful political challenges, economic challenges. Um, and in much of the world, it's not safe to be trans. And in the US and the UK, we've seen a recent rise in attacks on the accessibility of trans healthcare. Um, just this week, the state legislature in Arkansas banned life-saving, gender-affirming care for people under 19. A total of 28 states are considering bills that exclude trans people from sports or laws making trans healthcare a crime. This is a time when we need to stand with the trans community while their rights are under attack. Uh, as our panelists will tell you today, there's incredible joy and pride in being trans, and we believe it's vital to both value and uplift those stories while contributing material support. A positive storytelling is something we prioritize at the It Gets Better Project. Um, our mission uh, is to uplift, empower, and connect LGBTQ plus youth around the globe through storytelling and media, education, grant making, and the cultivation of a growing network of like-minded organizations serving LGBTQ plus young people. Our work now spans 19 countries across four continents and six major languages, reaching millions of young queer folk every year. Our partnership with Riot Games began in 2018 and with each passing year has expanded in scope to include everything from in-game activations, writer education ops, continuing education ops for It Gets Better Global Affiliates and our digital pride experience for queer youth everywhere. Uh, Today's event uh, is the perfect example of how we like to work with our partners to bring the stories of the LGBTQ plus community to life and I cannot wait to get started. But first, uh, we've put together a great set of video clips that highlight some of the incredible stories we've been able to tell as well as some of our previous work with Riot for National Coming Out Day. Let's take a look at that now. When I first like sort of looked in the mirror and in my head was like, I'm transgender. So it was scary, but I, I was I was grateful to finally have a word, you know? I remember being really happy that I found The Sims. I, I was free to do whatever I wanted and be whoever I wanted and explore who I was. I do build families where my parents exist and I'm just their son. I would say that I definitely strive for the life that I built for my Sims. It gets better, it definitely gets better. So Jude's Law, formerly known as the Birth Certificate Modernization Bill, was named after me because I was testifying since I was nine for the bill and just showed up each year, even though I got rejected each year until 2019. And I wrote a little story in fourth grade um, to like read, and I did, and I wasn't scared, and I was just kind of I think I've gotten a little bit more nervous actually each time I go as I like get older and actually realize the actual like weight of like testifying. Representative Titone and I have known each other for a while now and I think it's really just cool to see that she was like the first elected official that's trans in Colorado. To see trans people that are out invisible it's really 
inspiring for me. So what do you think that LGBTQ youth need to see online or aren't seeing? Um, well, I think more representation, honestly. More representation that kind of comes from a genuine space and not like a, well, I need to get like diversity points yeah. for this thing I'm doing. Like mm -hmm. stuff that's like, you know, including people who are, you know, not cis het, things like that mm -hmm. into spaces and doing it in a way where, hey, these are people who exist in our space because they exist in our space. I think the most fascinating aspect of a lot of conversations about representation is people like to pretend that they, they've never interacted with or, a trans person, a gay person, a bi person, yeah. you know, all this, but we're everywhere. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, even if it's one character in your in your little television show or whatever. Right. I think if you that's... can't sleep knowing that you are like the most pure, honest you, then yeah. like, what are you doing? I can strongly say that this past 10 years has been very inspiring with the coming out videos, with the story times, with the vlogs, with people, with their families, because seeing somebody within your community, even through a screen, makes you feel like you're never alone. So when I had decided to come out or tell the world that I was transgender that summer after graduating, I um, had to make a decision. I had been participating in mock trial my entire senior year, and I fell in love with my mock trial coach, Mr. Bullock, who's an incredible man, and I had promised him I would return my freshman year of college, so basically the next school year, to help him coach mock trial. I remember being so scared, and I walked in to my high school, and literally there was my entire mock trial team, my coach, my principal, and everyone just with open arms saying, Josie, Josie, like we love you so much, we're so happy for you, we accept you, we've always loved you. The only way that I was able to accept my womanhood was when I finally moved to New York and actually met the first transgender women I would meet, and those women changed my life because all of the misconceptions I had about who transgender people were melted away when I got to know real transgender people. Meeting these women and accepting them as who they were allowed me to accept myself. By May, I won prom queen and felt really seen and validated for the first time as, as a woman with my classmates who were, for the most part, very accepting. I think it made sense for me I, they had always thought I was the gay kid or flamboyant, but becoming a woman made sense for Corey in high school. Prior to the internet, it was really the television that was sort of my outlet to figure out who I really was. We were watching Charlie's Angels and Jacqueline Smith comes on the screen. I was like, that's me. And my mom was like, are you sure you're not Bosley? <laughs> I'm like, no, uh -uh, that's not me, no. That's me. But imagine, but think about how now, how many more young people like you and me are gonna now be able, oh, are gonna now be able to say, that's who I am. Yeah. Just think about that. I want me to go. Don't give up hope. I feel like I'm a perfect example of just like, I thought I'd seen it all. And, you know, I thought for me that life was over with, doing 10 years in prison. So for me, it's to tell the young people not to give up. Believe, dream, never stop dreaming, never give up, resist, fight like hell every oppression that's put in your way. And no, it's gonna get better. I'm due for a miracle. When I was in high school, uh, we tried to start an LGBTQ support group, and our school administrators told us that that was too controversial to have on campus. It wasn't easy, and a lot of it was bullying and it was hard. And just kind of standing up and telling people like, no, this is who I am and that's okay. I went to college um, with this activist attitude that I'm gonna change the world. At the time, that, that was really, really challenging. I was one of two out kids in my entire school uh, at the age of 16. I came out to a, a big team. There was a, there was a morning we had like a meeting booked and everyone was like, well, what is gonna happen at this meeting? 
And I said, like, Mom, I'm gay. And she looked at me and she was like, like, stupid. You think I didn't know that? And she just had this, like, smile on her face. I'm going to this college because it's rated the number one gay, unfriendly university in the nation. When I got there, we started off with a freshman orientation. There was this whole, like, activity where we'd all, like, find a shoe and then find the girl who had the other pair of the shoe, like, Cinderella kind of, kind of thing. And I immediately was like, oh, gosh, they're already, like, pairing us up like we're going to prom. This very <laughs> heterosexual straight prom. Why did I come here? Why did I think I could, like, change something this big? And I just told folks, like, hey, this is what's this is what's changing, and I was waiting for the for the world to end there, or for people to ask like awkward questions or whatever it was. And no, actually, there was like applause and hugs and reserving a bar for that night, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was like wildly counter to what I expected. She knew all along, and she was waiting for me to feel comfortable with who I was first. I had a friend in high school. And he had been out and proud for a very long time. Um, and he uh, was very open about it and very much like, let's go do gay stuff and I'll teach you all the gay things. And I was all like, oh, I'm so on board to learn all the gay stuff. But he really stuck by me and I probably <laughs> definitely would not be here if he had not been there and kind of helped me through that. Yeah, that was very, that was very connective. Like people, people wanted, to, wanted to know me. Uh, there's never gonna be one clear path or clear answer to, you know, how it's going to get better, right? Um, I think it's important to recognize that you really need to be kind to yourself first, uh, and you really need to focus on, on you first. Freshman orientation was obviously a big experience for me where I realized that I wasn't exactly a part of the normalized crew there. So I talked with the freshmen, um, the freshman leaders who are in charge of orientation. I told my story. I told them about how I felt so ostracized and different. And it worked. I was surprised, <laughs> but it worked. I just kept putting myself out there. And eventually I got to where I needed to be and the student groups there started um, our own student queer student group at the university and started changing things. When I had all of these catastrophic thoughts about how coming out was gonna go for me, like the worst case nuclear apocalyptic scenario that my life is gonna be completely cratered by this thing happening. Um, when I look back at that years, you know, from what is now years in the future, uh, I can say that some of those things happened and, and some of them didn't and some surprising good things happened and some surprising bad things happened, but I wouldn't make a different call. I think every single one of those bad things could have happened and I would still feel like I made the right call. Keep looking forward. It's gonna be hard and it will be hard for a while and sometimes it's not hard, but sometimes it is and it's really hard. And people don't really understand that, um, but just keep looking forward. There's a lot out there. There are communities. There are people out there who want to talk and meet you, and they want to know you. People that make you feel whole and complete and the wonderful person that you are are the people that you want in your life, and you uh, should seek them out. The last couple years have been really great. <laughs> I met an amazing girl. She really kind of got me thinking about life and where that goes and where we could be. And Last year in January, I asked her to marry me. We're gonna get married next year. <laughs> Things do get better, and you will find something out there that is more important to you than the feeling of people not accepting. Know that there are people out there who are willing to help, and whether it's your friend circle, your family, uh, a company you choose to work for, a group that you choose to take part in, there are people out there that you can connect with. For every one bad person, there are probably 10 more great ones who are willing to accept you into your life. You just have to find the courage to put yourself out there. And I know that that may not be possible for a lot of folks. So I would suggest to find the time that's right for you, but recognize that you're gonna be so much stronger 
and more beautiful and fabulous. <laughs> I believe in a world where hope outshines fear. I commit to stand up and speak out against hate and intolerance. My support for LGBTQ youth will be steadfast. I am part of a global community that is proud and resolute <laughs> in its effort to create a brighter and more inclusive world for all people. I know it will get better. Now, as we mentioned, the trans community faces deeply rooted structural obstacles to healthcare, as well as material problems such as food insecurity. Um, during the stream, we're going to be highlighting two charities. One is the Oka Project, a US-based collective that seeks to address global crisis faced by Black trans people by delivering home-cooked, culturally specific meals and resources. And the other is GATE, which is an international advocacy organization working towards justice and equality for trans, gender diverse, and intersex communities. Any donations you make today will go to the It Gets Better Project's grant-making fund and will then be split equally between those two organizations. We hope you'll join us in providing support to trans folks as we listen to their stories. You can click on the link in the About section of the It Gets Better Project's Twitch page to contribute. To kick us off, Rainbow Rioters is donating $5,000, but we'd love to see that total go higher. We'll put the information up on the screen real quick before hopping over to our panel. All right, uh, it's finally time to meet our panel. Great to see all of you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's do some quick introductions. Uh, first up, we have Zara Berry. Hi, Zara. Hello, uh, my name is Zara Berry. I'm a game designer on League of Legends. I primarily work on events, uh, but I also work with the Skins team. I work on Eternals and uh, I've been with Riot for almost two years now. So happy to be here today. Awesome, welcome. Uh, let's go over to Rowan. Hi there, my name is Rowan Noel Williams. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a non-binary writer on Legends of Runeterra and a narrative designer with over a decade of gaming industry experience. Uh, I've worked at a number of narrative-driven studios, including Obsidian, Telltale, and now Riot. And you might've known me or have heard many previously since I actually partnered with the It Gets Better project once before. So many thanks to them for that opportunity and for this one as well. Last time I talked about writing the first canonically transgender character in Riot's history, Tiari the Traveler. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that today in terms of representation and I'm also working on an indie project called Long Journey to an Uncertain End, which features a diverse cast of LGBTQ plus characters. Thanks, Rowan. It's good to see you again. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have August Black. Hey there. Uh, my name is August Black. I'm an actor and a voiceover artist in Los Angeles, California, and I'm also a transgender man. I play uh, one of the first AAA protagonist transgender characters, uh, Tyler Ronan who's had quite an impact being a, uh, a positive role model for the transgender community. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here and talk more about that. Great to meet all of you. So the way that this will work is that we'll trade off with some individual segments talking to each of our three panelists with specific questions about the work you do and your view on it. Um, and then we'll come back to our full panel to talk more broadly and thematically about the stories you're highlighting. For our first individual segment, we're going to go over to Zara to discuss storytelling through game design and the state of the industry today. Zara will be interviewed by writer Cooper Surratt. So Cooper, take it away. Hey everyone, uh, my name's Cooper. Uh, I work on the creative operations team over at Riot and I help to run events for our LGBTQIA plus employee resource group. Uh, so happy to be with y'all today. Zara, I'm really excited to talk to you about your thoughts on storytelling through game design. Um, I know you've got some really insightful takes for us based on what we talked about before. Um, so I will dive right into the questions with you. Um, my first one for you uh, is just a basic one. If you could explain for folks in the audience who might not already know more about what game designers do for their games and how it's separate from writing. Yeah, so this is a very broad question because it is uh, kind of asking what is design uh, broadly. And ultimately what it boils down to is it is intentionally making decisions about how something works, feels, or operates. And game design is just applying that to games. Uh, when you bring that into 
uh, how we can tell stories through this. It differentiates from writing in the way of making decisions about how a game plays, how it feels, how the systems interact, what the player may be doing to elicit certain feelings, actions, or experiences that is different than saying this character has experienced this plot or that this series of events will happen, which is more in the realm of writing. That isn't to say that they're entirely divorced. These two disciplines very frequently interact. And um, there's often people that work in both disciplines at the same time. Um, but that's kind of where the rule of thumb would keep them uh, separate but related. So it's intentionally making decisions to create experiences. Thank you. That was really thorough. That was perfect. <laughs> um, what kind of trans experiences can be portrayed through game design then? You know, how might a designer go about creating experiences around identity for a player? There are a lot of ways to go about doing this from um, a couple of the games we'll be talking about later today from uh, what Rowan will be discussing all the way to the game that uh, August stars in all the way to just ways that we can utilize individual systems design to help further cement plot points as being authentic or experiential. And it's more than just telling stories of transitions. Um, being able to tell somebody a story of what it's like to navigate a world of dating, for example, as a trans individual and having systems that can understand how confusing that may be or having systems that can convey how uh, empowering it is to feel like you are the one being pursued are things that can help players feel that sense of escape. And those are the ways that these experiences can be conveyed meaningfully and authentically. Um, these are, these are ways that design can help drive these stories home in a way that is meaningful to, you know, to both trans people and people looking to understand these stories that are not necessarily um, familiar with them themselves. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, then another question geared for you more as a player what do you look for in a game that's designed to positively represent trans identity? What do you want to see? Um, the, the number one thing I typically want to see is I don't really want to see stories where the, the twist at the end is dead naming a character or surprise this character was trans all along. Um, that always has a flavor of using the true form or transition trope negatively. It undermines somebody being their most authentic self in a game. Um, and that's kind of riding the line between design and narrative itself. But that typic, typical trope, I feel like, is something that um, I want to avoid. But so turning that on its head to positively represent trans identity, I would want to see characters that are already living their best life, right? Instead of showing things of struggling through transition, which can be um, a long, like sometimes scary process. And sometimes it can also be like an adventurous, exciting process. It would be just as exciting to have trans characters slaying dragons or going on adventures themselves. Like we see in a lot of different games, having these characters be fully realized already um, and being able to have the di these different like social systems be more authentically appealing or uh, having spaces carved out for these uh, th these authentic connections for trans audiences. Yeah, I really think that's what it's all about is trying to spin those negative tropes on their head and figure out how we can tell more positive stories out of them. I'm, I'm fully with you on. I, I, there's a lot of trans people living their best lives, just not in the stories we tell a lot of the time. Um, what do you think then, and th this is an extremely broad question, but um, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. What do you think of the state of trans storytelling in the game industry today? Um, you could even expand that to, to broader media as well. 
Uh, I think ultimately there are a lot of very big strides happening in a lot of uh, a lot of independent games right now. There are a lot of really really interesting games that you can go and play, and a lot of really fun games you can go and play. Um, there are like tell me why is uh, a very good game to go play. Anything by AVB is a good game to go play for these experiences. Um, we're starting to see more and more of this representation come into like AAA. Uh, ultimately though, what I would say is it's still overwhelmingly in the minority. It's more often than not when you see games uh, for trans people, it's trans people taking cis spaces and carving it for themselves. And that is taking something that is um, not necessarily intended for us and making it for us because it wasn't originally made with us in mind. Um, so just taking some of the things that are more escapism, more adventurous and like more aspirational and carving spaces intentionally for trans people is something that I would like to see moving into the future, mostly because uh, what I see today is that while there is positive trend in a lot of this representation and like design work for these audiences, it's still very much in the minority. Yeah, that was so phenomenal. I think that's really forward facing and um... Yeah, I just think that's really insightful. Thank you so much, Sara. Um, cool, so I'm going to pass it back over to the full panel now so that we can get everyone's thoughts on this general subject. I know we're running a little ahead of time, but uh, yeah, please feel free to take all the time you need. Pass it back over. Thanks, Cooper. Um, uh, as here we are, we are in all of our glory here. So let's dive right in. Um, for, for all the panelists, um, what do you think of the state of trans storytelling in the game industry today? Should I pick on someone? I was going to talk and then I forgot to uh, unmute myself. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I, you know, I think Zara said it, said it beautifully. Um, you know, there, it is the minority. And, and as a person who isn't super into the gaming world and have just kind of just started to figure it out, there are some really powerful trans characters that are that are coming to play that are more in the indie games and that are less at the forefront of of the gaming conversation. And in order to, you know, to continue, we have to continue making positive characters for positive representation. And I think Sara really nailed it with saying that we are the minority when it comes to representation in gaming. Of oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, and in and. And, you know, I, I always go back to this one thing that I saw when I was watching uh, Disclosure. It's like, if if we had more representation, the, the negative representation wouldn't make up so much of our representation. And so it's really just bringing more trans characters into the forefront, bringing more, and having them be just characters that also have, happen to live that trans experience. Um, but I'm not a gaming expert, so I'll toss it over to someone else. <laughs> Good insights, August. Rowan, what, what do you think? Yeah, I would agree with all of that. I actually think in terms of kind of like what the state of the storytelling is in the industry today, it's much better than it was, but it's not as good as it could be. Um, I think in some regards, it's honestly just starting to pick up. It hasn't quite hit its stride. Ideally, we'd be able to look at a game with a trans protagonist and be like, ah, oh, yeah, like all these other games with trans protagonists that don't focus on their transition, but who they are as a character. Uh, and I think we're also kind of like struggling to break away from the prior preconceived notions of if a character is anything other than like says hat white male, we have to tell the audience. And that's kind of like where you get those characters like the one from uh, Mass Effect, which were not perhaps as well executed upon as they could have been. Well, what, what do folks think need to happen for games to move into more positive, well-informed representation of trans people? We can maybe go in reverse order here. So sorry for jumping right in. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things here that's so paramount to kind of like getting 
better trans representation is the first and foremost education and research. Um, doing the work yourself before asking your trans friends and peers to educate you. Also, like maybe don't ask things that are a Google search away, especially when it comes to using offensive language. Uh, and additionally, I think trying to commit to telling an authentic story, which comes from trans people themselves, not just kind of like an internal dialogue that you have with yourself, unless you've done a considerable amount of the research or are trans. Um, I think also maybe don't be afraid to tell a story that isn't informed by someone transition. I know for certain there are some people who don't want to be known or seen as trans. They just want to be known for who they are as a person. And I don't think we're quite at the point where we want to, again, kind of calling back to what uh, Zara said, we don't want to do the shock value thing or casual representation. Um, we, we want to invest now in the future of trans representation. So hopefully we'll be able to get there. Oh, and I, I will say I was, one thing that stuck out, you said research, right? And from our conversation during the Global Summit last December, I was so impressed with the incredible mythology and all of the background information and the thoughts and the sensitivity that went into what elements made it into the game. Um, and it was just, it was beautiful and overwhelming. And, and frankly, it's, it's, it is a testament to how much thought goes into even the smallest details uh, when introducing uh, trans characters into, into games. I think relatedly um, going into, into the next portion, it, it is kind of talking about um, like, we want to talk about like how does trans representation in game studios um, and trans people being a part of game development um, affect the way that these stories are represented. I know one of the things that uh, is very important for well-informed representation of trans people in games is something that I like to espouse about game design overall is that the number one tool in a designer's belt is always going to be empathy. And one of the things that I feel like needs to be built actively as a practice is more empathy for trans people out of like design and narrative design together um, so that this representation can be built like over time and can be built strongly on a very significant foundation. And this is very much related to what Jessica was saying in the way that working with trans designers, working with trans developers together builds that empathy to like in a very direct sense. I, I love that. That's such a great way to, to explain it. It's like empathy. And I always like to say like it, the intent, the positive, you're going into it with a good intent to build a positive character and it's really the effort you know that they're putting it putting behind this character and having respect for that person and their experience as a transgender human you know that was one thing that I really felt when I was working on tell me wise it was I wasn't just respected as a, as a transgender person but I was respected as an actor and with all of my experiences as just a human being and that and I feel like that was why it really was such a positive thing is because it they went in there with the intent of having creating a, a positive representation and not just for the trans community but for also the clinic culture and they did the work you know and that's that's the most important is they did the work and they they brought empathy to the characters so that not just they felt the empathy but also they created empathy among their audience yeah i agree so strongly with Sarah's point about empathy and with August's point about respect, those are so crucial to understanding and to creating positive representation. Uh, I also think that obviously people with the experience can speak to that experience the best. Lived experience is better than a creative storyteller almost every time and it sidesteps misrepresentation. And when it comes to diversity, diversity is always going to mean better stories, better games, better companies, almost universally. We're not just part of a culture, we're contributing to the culture and to feel seen and heard and recognized means a lot. Awesome. I think um, on the back of a lot of the answers that you all mentioned, you know, as we kind of um, build that empathy and uh, kind of see real representation within, within games, you know, wh where do you kind of see as the is the future of trans storytelling in games and, and beyond that? 
And also, what do you want to see specifically? Um, I would like to talk about this this animation that I watched, and it was uh, they it was an animation on Netflix, and the one of the there was like a group of kids that survived this natural disaster. It's called Japan Japan Sinks, and um, and I'm watching it, and this one main character, he's so cool, and he's he's the hero, and he's kind of a badass, and he's just doing doing the whole thing and they don't mention that he's trans until you see the credits and I connected with this character for all of the reasons of his, who he is as a person and like what he brought to this character in the very beginning and it had nothing to do with his transness and I think that that is something that I would love to see is that he's the hero just because that's who he's being you know that's just who he is and you get this teeny tiny little snippet of you know this other side of him that that you know that that's a part of him but it's not the forefront and I feel like that's you know where I'd love to see trans representation going is that being trans is just a part of my identity and I feel like that should be a part of other characters too it's just a part of who we are as as like a, you know as just a person Yeah, I agree with that. I think in terms of like what I would like to see is more. I want more. <laughs> I want to see trans and queer characters not as an afterthought or as a side character, but as the main characters. More of that. Yes. Uh, and I do see that in the future too. Um, I talked a little bit about the side project I'm working on, but two of the main characters are trans. And that to me is like shocking, but amazing. Two out of five characters of your main cast are trans. And I also see the future of this kind of storytelling branching into more things than just story heavy games, which ultimately gives us the best opportunity to tell that story in a comprehensive and complete way. But if you look at stuff like Celeste, it's a pretty narrow window for a storytelling opportunity, but it is a great game and it really furthers representation. Most definitely. I, I agree with all of that wholeheartedly. I think, I think the, the best way to say it is exactly how Rowan opened with that is just more it's entirely getting the volume of it cranked as high as it can possibly go. Getting more of these stories out into the world is how we build everything that we've been talking about. It's how we build empathy in our audience. It's how we build empathy among our peers. Having these opportunities arise and building these characters is how we can share this culture with everybody. Like culture is like, this shared idea and this shared series of values between people and like the volume of the stories that we share helps build that together and being able to get a volume of that out into the world is how we can start getting there and so just not stopping at one character and pointing to them as the good representation is a very key part of that like being able to point to one character as this is good representation, how about 45 more, like is a good example of like where we should be going. I love these answers. Um, and I think, you know, to kind of wrap up this, this first uh, topic, I, I think if this is self-evident to some extent, but, you know, we'd love to also hear kind of why this group kind of feel thinks and feels like telling stories about characters with our identities, why that is so important. Um, we'd love to hear your perspectives on that. Um, I've, I think like, you know, to normalize the trans experience, you know, to, to, to include it in, and not make it the forefront of the character's story is just to, to normalize who they are. And, it, and I think that it's really about not follow, follow falling, <laughs> not falling into those stereotypes of just talking about the transition or just talking about this, but also, you know, being proud of who they are, you know, you're like, okay, I'm a proud trans man, I I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my non binary identity. Um, I'm a proud trans woman, and, and I'm moving forward into life bringing those two different experiences. And you know, a trans experience is, is unique, and, and you walk through the world and in, in all of the things that you experience. And I think everyone does that. You know, you carry your experiences with you no matter who you are and what you've been through. So when it comes to trans characters, it's like you and all LGBTQ plus characters, it's really about making it 
a part of them that that benefits them instead of this like idea that their transition has hurt them it's like their transition helped them you know it's it's really what became what helped them become a happier better version of themselves it's not all about the trauma of being trans or the trauma of coming out and things of that sort I think, I think another thing to uh, point out is that telling stories about identity helps us understand and become familiar with an identity. And one of the things that's important about that is that as people interact with other people, understanding identity is one of the ways that we can connect. When we meet somebody and we can understand and wrap our heads around an identity, we can immediately begin to like make connections with that person because we can begin to construct like what we would have done in their shoes or what their life was like when they begin to say, Oh, well, I grew up in this state or, you know, I moved to the U S when I was 16 from London. Um, we can begin to understand the differences in our own lives and the similarities in our own lives. And that's like the basis of connection. And if you don't have a basis of, I, of these identities and you don't have a basis of understanding almost that language of connection, then it's really hard to build these relationships and telling stories about these identities is one of the many ways that we can extend that language to everybody. And so having this representation in our media helps extend that language to everybody so that we can have more of those connections extend outside of games and outside of movies and outside of shows. Those are both such beautiful answers. I had to like kind of clear my throat to not be choked up as I reply. Um, I think for myself, like the level of authenticity that we're able to bring to those stories is, is our lived experiences, right? And we are so much more than that one defining facet. And it is a defining facet. But I think too, when we're able to give a more robust story to trans characters, that's kind of like what helps it feel lived in you know it's I hate to make this metaphor as kind of like comfortable clothing but when you're finally comfortable in your clothing it's like so cozy you know you can just kind of settle into it and I feel like that's what it is to settle into a trans story is like this is something that I'm comfortable in finally you know I love that Any other, any other responses or, all right. I think we're good to wrap up. And I think we're gonna be transitioning to, um, are we transitioning to a video or are we going to reintroduce in the stream? I think we're gonna reintroduce. Get a little text right down there. Okay, cool. So for anyone who's just tuning in, this is Trans Stories Through Gaming, a panel discussion hosted by Riot Games and It Gets Better Project. We're chatting with game designer Zara Berry, narrative writer Rowan Williams, and voice actor August Black. We are also raising funds for two charities at the Okra Project, a collective that seeks to address the global crisis faced by Black trans people by bringing home cooked, healthy, and culturally specific meals and resources to Black, black trans people, and GATE, uh, an international advocacy organization working for justice and equality for trans and intersex people. Uh, to donate, uh, go to the link in the About section of the It Gets Better Project's Twitch page. Awesome. Hey, everyone. I'm back. <laughs> What's up? Um, we are chatting now with Rowan Williams, narrative writer for the card game Legends of Runeterra. Uh, their work for Riot is notable in that they wrote the first canonically transgender character in Riot's history, Tiari the Traveler. We're going to talk a bit more about Tiari and Roan's experience developing her story, but first we'll show off some of the card art that Tiari is featured on and some VO lines that Tiari uses to interact with the other characters. Return soon with stories of your climb. I'll see you again after I reach the peak. I'll become who I was always meant to be. Don't you see your face in her stars? We lean on compassion when we lose our footing. Sure, 
But really, watch your footing. I'm ready to take the first step. My journey begins here and ends at the top. Not at all, little traveler. But you'll see for yourself. Whatever the journey brings, I welcome it. Come, my judgment will determine your fate. Please, Keeper, look into my heart. I'm not as strong as you were. What if I can't make it? No, you have nothing to prove but to yourself. I am more myself than ever. I've never wanted anything so much in my life. Then trust your instincts to guide you. Cool. Uh, so we just saw a little uh, like preview of a bunch of the different card art, some of the VO lines that Tiari has. Um, and I know that doesn't come with a lot of context for people who haven't actually played the game. Um, so Rowan, if you could, could you tell us a little more about uh, the narrative of this and Tiari's journey to the top of Mount Targon? Absolutely. So Tiari basically starts off at the bottom of this big mythical mountain. It's been likened to Mecca or Olympus or other big mountains in myth and legend that have some amount of power kind of waiting at the top. And I don't think that Tiari is quite so motivated by the power that entails as she is her own personal power. She wants to know herself, to see herself realized and actualized. So all that drives her to make this climb, which she does beside a couple of others who are pursuing perhaps less altruistic goals in reaching the top and claiming power for their own. And at the end, Tiari's noble goal is recognized, and she's basically immortalized as a celestial, which is a powerful sort of demigod. Awesome. And that's that card that we see at the end, right? The uh, the traveler at the end. And she's spe that those VO lines that um, were at the end of the video are her speaking to herself, almost pre-climb. Um, so... What is it that drove you to tell this particular story of the Traveler? What is it that drove you to tell a trans story within this, this framework? That's a great question. I saw the opportunity in the card art and the story that they were associated with when I first came to the studio. Um, it was actually one of the first things that I worked on and one of the first efforts I sort of headed up. We being Legends of Runeterra had already had an epic character both well received and well told in Cythria, who is kind of a that one epic character slash follower that gets highlighted across a series of cards. And the thought that was then put into Tiari wrapped them in about 10 cards, just shy of that, all told. So this was a great way of putting it to others that like, obviously you can see them physically going on this journey. And then through the use of voice lines with both Tiari and the Traveler and their interactions with others, you can see that this is more than just the physical component of climbing the peak. And it's more than just a bid for power. Awesome. So maybe you can talk a little more about the back end of what took to get this story actually created and put out into the world. You know, what obstacles did you have to work through um, in order to get the story told? I think there were some obstacles sort of universally. So technically at the studio level, it meant running things through a lot of gates, not just checking with groups to be sure that this representation felt authentic and good, but also to be sure that publishing and localization could handle it. Um, LGBTQ content is outright illegal in many of the companies that were partnered with, so it took a lot of walking a very thin line to be sure that we could meet with standards elsewhere while upholding the story and staying true to the original intent. Um, Gameplay-wise, it's a little weird since the, both cards operate in the same space at the same time. It's a little evergreen. They're, they can be played side by side, in which case you're looking at both Tiari and the Traveler, which might be a little jarring for some people but that means keeping Tiari optimistic and determined and the traveler more confident and empowered. And personally, it required being pretty willing to learn and accept being wrong. Um, I'm trans, but I'm not a trans woman. And I wasn't out at the time other than being sort of down low non-binary. So getting buy-in from a lot of people at Riot, which I'm very, very grateful for, taught me a lot. Yeah. In, in terms of the way to that the, the the cards interact with each other, you know, Tiari versus the Traveler um, post climb, like I think those VO, VO lines really perfectly express their personalities um, and, and how that change happens. Um, once you sort of get a sense of what the story is, it's it's really powerful. Um, so 
a question in regards to that then, you know, this is a card game. Um, the only bits of narrative that you have are number one, those VO lines, as well as some of the flavor text that goes onto the cards, um, unless there's, you know, outside lore, et cetera. How do you tell a story through such limited means? You know, what methods are you using to get players access to a story that they might only see in brief flashes or not chronologically? <laughs> that, that's a really good question. Um, I think we are limited in the storytelling capacity, but it's not restrictive. So as you mentioned, we have art from one card to the next. We have voice lines from one character and also shared between characters. We have text to accompany the artwork. And we have a little bit in terms of publishing or social media to help. Uh, as for how to access the story, I think one of the nice things about the game is that it's free to play. Like obviously that's not accessible for everyone, but there are also places where the content exists outside of the game that are readily accessible. And I hope that some of that comes across through those flashes in the story that people do get. I hope that they're able to see kind of like by making the connection and putting things together for themselves and also experiencing those moments in the character as they interact with others that they're able to see. Yeah, something I'll note about that that video that we just showed is um, that Tiari takes, you know, it's a piece of every one of those pieces of card art, um, and they're all different characters that you can play at different times in the game, but put together in a chronological order, they tell a really wonderful story. Um, so a more general question, looking at you know, the representation that Riot has done so far, which uh, is somewhat limited, right, especially in terms of, of transness, how do you see the Traveler affecting queer representation broadly in games of Riot going forward? Oh, gosh, you know, I just said it with one of the prior questions, but I hope it means more. You know, we, yeah. we know it's sorely needed, and the audience reaction tells us that it's not only a good idea, it's, we said internally, hey, we need diversity in the stories that we tell. And the audience was like, we want more of this universally. We just want more of it. I don't think that it's just based on that response. We know that it's necessary and that it speaks to our players. And I think that that really paves the way for opportunities. I think we're going to find more ways to be true to our audience as well. Since, you know, in many regards, the Traveler wasn't actually everyone's cup of tea for a variety of reasons and could have been touched up a bit more on my end. But I think that we're going to see more representation like this in the future. And also, I think we're going to be able to get more help getting these things out to more and more regions across the world without kind of fear of the stigma. Yeah, I think that's a really fantastic call out. You know, I um, just from what people are telling me, I think there's some folks in chat who are, who are really asking about, you know, how how is Riot contributing to this? How, how are we adding queer representation and trans representation into our games? Um, so that's, that's good. It's good to know that we, you know, we have that intent. Um, a final question leaving off for you. What resources and support do you think writers in general need in order to get these, these types of stories told? I'm so glad you asked that. Um, right now, one of the things they've focused on internally is getting resources parsed out for people who are interested in telling these stories, but may not have the context necessary, either in terms of education or being authentic to the source material. So I'm, I can tell you right now for myself, I'm putting together sort of a packet of information. Uh, as for what sort of support writers need, being well-informed is always very, very powerful. But knowing that you have the support of your team is a beautiful thing. I definitely didn't do all of this on my own. I had the help and support of narrative, art, design, production, publishing, and all of them were crucial to getting the more technical and creative aspects of the character pushed. Especially because at a AAA company, it can be so challenging to get multiple teams aligned. So just as a little shout out, um, Mel Lee, Sean Main, and Andrew Silver were the leads on this set where Tiari was released, and I couldn't have done it without them, so I'm very grateful for all of their help. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for all of that. That was really wonderful. Uh, I am now going to pass it again back over to the full panel to talk a little bit more about some of the themes that we just touched on. Thanks, Cooper. Uh, let's get into our first question for the full group. Um, and I'll start with the first one, which is kind of referring back to the Traveler. Um, the Traveler story kind of focuses on the character's beauty and power and kind of the process of her transition while climbing Mount Targon. So start off with what do you think is beautiful or powerful about being trans and giving that to the group? All of it. <laughs> all of it. It's all powerful and beautiful and, and coming out is powerful and you have to be incredibly strong and and really learning to love yourself for the, the person that you, you know, for a while didn't want to be, you know, I think that that's something that is 
hard to to think about but i mean today's trans day of visibility and, and and even seeing yourself was a struggle for a very long time and i think that that seeing this this character as someone who is powerful and beautiful and 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 owns it is is uh is really you know what trans is being like what it is to be trans for me at least yeah i am giving two big thumbs up to that i think it's <laughs> powerful especially because we recognize something about ourselves and have the courage to persist despite people striving against us right i i don't mean to be negative but even at this very moment in 2021 there are people debating trans rights in the u.s which is like ridiculous that's shameful we have the courage to persist because transitioning isn't easy and it takes a ton of patience and acceptance of who we are and it's beautiful to see people become who they are who they felt they couldn't be anywhere from a few years to several money and trans is beautiful i i know that a lot of the time when we talk about representation when it comes to bodies we say all bodies are beautiful but we don't see trans bodies that often. And I think there is a stigma around that. And for me personally, I just really think it's beautiful that the stigma there can or will go away. Yeah, plus one to all of that. And another thing that, that really helps build into is uh, the notion that I know who I am. Trans people get to know who they are. Part of transitioning is the clarified note of self-identity there are plenty of cisgendered people in my life who still don't know who they are and that is a different tragedy but part of the beauty of transition is getting to know yourself so intimately that you have this crystallized idea of who you actually are Thanks for those answers. Um, you know, this next question is kind of an extension of the first, which is, you know, this group has kind of described, um, you know, there's trauma and also being trans uh, in a world that's, that is this centered and, and with, and as you all mentioned, also a beauty of transness that many people, you know, feel within themselves. And so in a story, in, in stories made for public, primarily cisgender audience, like what, what stories should we prioritize telling? I mean, all stories, I think like, as an actor, you know, first and foremost, you know, we, we can do anything. That's the whole, that's the whole point of being an actor. You can, you can become and uh, embody whatever you really want to, whether it's the bad guy or the good guy or the love interest or the boy next door or the girl next door. And I think that if you're, you know, if you want to, if, because we need to push trans actors and, and trans stories, it's, it's you know it doesn't have to be one thing because we can we can be anything and that's kind of something that i feel like the cisgender audience needs to see more of it's because they're really seeing these trans stories that are almost always about transitioning and becoming instead of we are and it's like well we are this and we are so many things and that's you know that's that's for me is is like kind of one of my driving forces as a creator and as an artist Yeah, most definitely. It's it's hard to pick a priority on the style of story because so many different people need different things. There there could be somebody that needs a story about hope at the end of transition right now, but there could also be somebody that needs to hear a story of normalizing trans people. And there could be somebody else that needs a story of escapism. Meanwhile, there's somebody else that needs a story that acts as a surrogate for an experience they didn't get because they transitioned later in life. And so with so many different needs for so many different people in and out of the trans community involving trans characters and trans stories, it's really hard to pick one priority, which is why it comes back to, we need a volume of trans stories and we need a volume of diverse tr trans stories. So like, it's hard to pick one priority or one thing that is like the silver bullet for the methodology. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's so significant about kind of like making these stories public is that we're so much more than our challenges and we're not just the challenges that we've faced. We're people, we have stories that are vibrant as and robust as everybody else. 
And that's just another part of our experience, albeit a significant one. But people are made up of a big old tapestry of feelings and emotions. It's not just the one thing. So I think in terms of priority for us as audience, it's it's about showing characters as accessible and being relatable. And if we can sympathize with main characters or any characters that are involved with the plot, I think it'll be that much more obvious that trans storytelling is, and I'm using big air quotes, just storytelling like it would be for any other character. Uh, and Rowan, I, I know you speak, um, you speak really well to this. I'm curious what other people think. Is there value uh, in using metaphor to describe transition and what limitations exist in doing so? And how can, how can we connect those metaphors to real experiences? Ooh, can can I go? Is that okay? Yeah, please. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. um, I, I think this kind of fits in with career coding, despite it being a little bit more straightforward that than outright withholding a specific piece of information about a character. But it's a way of showing people that they're seen and recognized while being able to get content pushed. And that's the benefit and the drawback. I think metaphor is limiting because we can't outright speak directly to the people in the audience and say, like, hey, yes, this is meant to represent you and me, and we share in this thing. But it is a way of saying like, look, you exist just like I do. And you're here and seeing even if it's not acknowledged or if you're not ready to talk about it, which maybe that's a little good, honestly. Um, because I personally don't go around telling everyone about myself, like divulging these personal details to them. And I also think that we're able to focus a little more on metaphor when we're not quite as concerned with delving into the specifics. So to kind of like that last point, transitioning is very personal. And there are people who choose to make that more visible than others. But metaphor is a good stand-in in the same way that it is in a good story in media, we see what's most relevant to the story on the screen, less so the in-between that isn't relevant to the plot of the characters, if that makes sense. August, Sarah, would you like to add to that? I feel like they said it really well. Um, you know, transition, like like uh, like they said, it's it's it's, it's hard and it's, um, it's a long process. And so, you know, I feel, but I feel like everyone goes through their own transition and something that Zara touched on is like, there are, there are cis people who don't know themselves as well as many of my trans friends that, because we are pushed to become this version of ourselves because there's not really, you know, much of a future without that. And, and not in, in like a, you know, end all do all, but in like a sense where pre-transition, I didn't, know what my future was supposed to look like I couldn't see it and then when I had finally accepted myself I was like oh I have this whole path and opportunity because I finally know what version of myself is going to move forward and I think when we talk about using metaphors it's like I feel like cis people get so much space to discover who they are it's like oh you're a kid you don't know you don't you don't have to decide what you are going to be when you're grown up yet and i think that that's something that we don't talk about with trans youth is like you, you know everyone's want to ever when when they talk about trans youth and the arkansas bill that just passed it's like well they need to know who they are right now and it's like did you know who you were when you were 14 like a hundred percent you know you have to give trans people just as much space as you give cis youth and that's, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily a metaphor, but uh, that's where I, I went. <laughs> but kind of carrying in that way. I would say uh, the moving beyond the focus for like transition into like broader narratives or like moving into metaphors is it's difficult because there there is already so much of a precedent and focus on on transition and there's already so mm -hmm. much of a focus on um transition at the the heart of like the conversation and it's just going to be it's just going to be about like blazing that trail forward and like putting these characters into these positions for the first time uh in a lot of cases and setting the precedent ourselves to move past it well you you bring up um you perfect segue into my next question sarah which is is really about the focus on transition 
and its novelty and how many stories tend to focus on that. How do we move beyond that focus into more substantial narratives about the lives of trans people? I think this is such, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go, go, Rowan. Yeah, my, my bad. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I think it's such a, a great question. I don't think it's inappropriate for trans people to tell that story because it is a big moment where you're changing presentation potentially and like re sort of introducing yourself to the world. But it's also just not a single moment. Like there's no one moment that crystallized for me about being trans. It's sort of an ongoing process, I think, for a lot of people. And I won't speak for others, but something that really stuck out to me about a particular YouTuber story of their transition over the course of just shy of a decade was like, this is my last video about my transition because I'm not transitioning anymore. I am this person. I know that's a little prosaic, but it stuck with me. And I think my prior comment stands about, we do have these robust and vibrant stories as trans people. Our gender doesn't define everything about us. If we can tell the story of who we are and what we're experiencing first and foremost, that's going to inform the story as well. Yeah, I, I agree to that. I feel like, you know, we, we, we think about, you know, transgender and then we immediately go into transition and, and a transition is, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an, it's an umbrella term for a period of time. And I've been on hormones for four years. I feel like the first two or three, I really was, was changing a lot and becoming this, this more confident version of myself, but my, my identity didn't really change. And, you know, just because I feel like I've, I've moved past like the biggest part of my transition doesn't take away the fact that you're still trans afterwards. And I think that's something that you also have to remember is like transition and being trans. They're not, they're not just, they're, they're not one thing. It's not like, the, it's not the same thing. So if you, you can take transition out of a trans story and still have it be a trans story. If that makes sense. Totally. totally. Thank you. Most definitely. I would plus one to that where it's, it's a process and it's something that doesn't necessarily have to be in the past of a character that we're telling a story about. It's not necessarily something that needs to be done with or finished. It is a major part of a lot of people's lives and it is an ongoing thing for many people. And whether it's something that somebody is pursuing medically or whether something somebody isn't pursuing medically, the process is social, physical, emotional. There are a lot of different vectors that somebody can pursue or not pursue to have this authentic experience. And a lot of times these processes can be either depicted in tandem with an actual, like a main story or game or show that we're depicting alongside of it or it can be like the focus. And I think that the main way we move away from it is just pulling the focus away from that and letting the, the transition be something that is, the, the person is experiencing that is forming like them and that they're going through, but is not the crux of the story that is being told. Yeah. And it's one of, I, you know, I, I feel like you could almost compare it to like, you know, not every teen story out there is about puberty. Like if we put every teen story that's out there and you just focused on puberty, it'd be really awkward and just consistently telling the same awkward phase of life. And, and like, not that, you know, transition is awkward, but it can be. And it's a lot like puberty where you're changing in different ways. And so a teen love story is, is, is not about, it's not solely about them just like, a, you know, becoming this attracted to somebody else it's it's about their love and their experience with this other person and so it's you know I feel like that's a good way to look at it it's like if you're telling a teen story you're normally not just telling it about the fact that they went from 10 to 14 you're telling it because they're this new person and they're discovering themselves I think relatedly to your answer, August, like um, the next question is, is kind of touching on a lot of those aspects. And so when we do talk about transition, you know, how do we do so sens sensitively with care and respect? And um, maybe that there's other stories or considerations that this group has that you're to hear and, um, and, and what sort of care needs to be taken in those stories? 
I mean, it goes back to like a lot of the other answers that we have. It's it's respect to per, a person's experience. You know, transition is n- not easy, n- no matter how you go about it, whether it's uh, medically or um, socially. You're you're changing the way the world sees you, which is the way that the world behaves around you. And and a lot of those moments, you re you have to relearn. And so while you're relearning, you know, you have to you have to kind of take into consideration everyone else is kind of relearning too. And, and it's really patience. You know, when I, when I talk to people about transition, I, I always lead with the fact that you have to go about it with patience, patience for yourself, patience with other people, um, because everything kind of just takes time and it takes time to get used to it and, and to find this like sweet spot, I guess. Um, but effort too, you know, especially when you're telling a trans story, you need to put the effort into into respecting and uh, this very raw moment. Any other thoughts from Rose, Zara? Go ahead, Zara. I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> I, I think that was rather encompassing for it the the major thing that i would add is just with the focus on respect and sensitivity when talking about transition is also the acknowledgement of that everybody transitions differently and that not everybody has the same idea of it um not everybody transitions medically not everybody transitions socially um the, the, the various differences in these experiences are just as broad as everybody's different expressions themselves. And so that goes hand in hand with the sensitivity and the respect in like representing those journeys. So that would be what I would add. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. And I would say too, I know I've banged the drum a couple of times on this, but like if you are not someone who is trans or do not have a trans experience or do not know somebody who's trans and like lived through it with them just check in with people if you want to tell an authentic story like no better way to do that than go to the source awesome all right we're going to transition over to the uh reintroducing new viewers to the stream so and then and then we're going to follow up on, a, on some info on our charity so one more time for anyone who's just tuning in you're watching trans stories through gaming um, it's a panel discussion hosted by riot games and the it gets better project we're chatting with game designer zara berry narrative writer rowan williams and voice actor august black we are also we are also raising funds for two charities, the Okra Project, a collective that seeks to address the global crisis faced by Black trans people by bringing home cooked, healthy, and culturally specific meals and resources to Black trans people, and GATE, an international advocacy organization working for justice and equality for trans and intersex people. To donate, go to the link in the About section of the It Gets Better Project's Twitch page. And so far, we've raised over $2,700 in addition to the $5,000 donated by Rainbow Rioters. So keep it coming. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Y'all, by the way, your panel uh, answers are amazing, and I am uh, about to cry, so I love it. We are here with our final panelist, August Black. Uh, He is a voice actor for the character Tyler Ronan in Tell Me Why. Um, That's the first playable trans character in a AAA studio game, or one of the first. Uh, August, I'm really excited to chat with you a bit more. Um, First, I want to give folks a bit more context on what Tell Me Why is. Uh, So it's a narrative, choose-your-own-adventure game about Tyler and Allison, uh, the reunited twins who use their special bond to unravel the memories of a troubled childhood. Uh, When they were forced to kill their mother in self-defense because she attacked them. Uh, Now, Tyler, uh, as we learned sort of in the beginning of the story, believed that their mom was angry because he had cut his hair. Uh, But the story's kicked off when he realizes that that is not the entire truth. Um, And we're going to see that in a clip from the game. Tyler. (laughs) Tyler. What? Look. What? 
Where did you find that? It was on her desk with her papers. Seriously? Are you kidding me? Look, we gotta be really careful not to overthink this. But it doesn't make any sense. She, she was mad, right? She was mad I, I, I cut my hair. She attacked me because I cut my hair. She was mad and she attacked you. We both saw it. Then what is this I don't know. I don't know. Tyler, come here. She can't do this to me. Not now. When I f finally made sense of a few things. Well, that was your first mistake. Thinking the world made any kind of sense. Ten years in the grave, and she's still finding new ways to piss us off. Yeah. Cool. Oof. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, that scene always gets me. <laughs> it's it's a good scene. Um, that is basically the premise of uh, the story of Tell Me Why for the audience. Um, this character, Tyler Ronan, believed that his mother attacked him as a child because he was trans, and in self-defense, he killed her. Uh, but we make a huge discovery in this clip, which actually gives us our main conflict. There is evidence that his mom was actually supportive of his transition. You see that book that they found in uh, her room. So, August... What do you think Tyler is feeling in this moment? And how does it relate for you to the relationships that a lot of real life trans people actually have with their families? I think that, you know, what Tyler is, is, is going through in that moment is he's reconsidering that feeling that the worst thing that could have possibly happened, happened to him when he finally embraced himself and cut his hair and decided that he was going to live as a boy. And, um, and in response, he thought his mom tried to kill him for it. And I think that that, that is, you know, the fear of being met with violence at, when you come out as trans is valid as a trans person today. Um, and there's this idea and this feeling that when we do come out, it's like we're taking somebody away from our family. Instead of becoming ourselves, we're taking this person away that they love. And so in this moment, when, when Tyler is, is reeling from discovering that his mom actually supported him and not only supported him, but wanted to know how to do it the best way that she could, he has to rethink his whole cope, the whole, the whole way that he, he was coping with this thing and how he was like, you know, well, this was just how she reacted and, 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 it, and it didn't have anything to do with me. It had to do with the fact that she was small minded in that moment. And so it was like, I mean, I, I, I mean, I still get that tight chest that I had when I was recording this scene, because it just, it just pulls at you. Um, and I can't, I can't say exactly what he was feeling. Uh, I just, I can feel it though, I guess is like, it's hard to verbalize it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is, it cuts deeply and emotionally in like the yeah in the deepest way possible I think <laughs> like yeah. like after 10 years your your entire perception of one of the most pivotal moments of your childhood is completely changed and that's yeah yeah that's, and you have to rethink it you know and, and, uh, and I loved this moment not only for the game but also just for my my own personal like experience is like when we had got when we had finished recording this um Erica Lindbeck who plays Allison we were in the same room and it was the whole development team. And after we had recorded these lines, I looked up and everyone's crying because of how, like, it really is just such a powerful switch because it's, it's like, she still loved me and I get to move forward in life with that now, even though it is, it, there's so much baggage and stuff attached to that. I get to move forward that my mom actually, she loved me and she wanted to support me as this, as, as a trans person. And, and, um, that is, that's priceless. Yeah. That's phenomenal. I, um, yeah, I can tell you playing the game. Like I, I knew this was coming and I still had like a little gasp when it happened. So, um, 
I love that answer. Thank you. Uh, we have another clip uh, to lead into our next question. Um, so in this next clip, we're going to see how Tyler and Allison use two of the fantastical elements of the game. Um, so that's their telepathic voice and their bond, which is a visualization of their memories. So we'll see an example of that now. Wait, I, um, I'm feeling something strange. Don't leave this room until everything looks as clean as a whistle. Ugh. This is the millionth time I've gotten in trouble because of you. You and your big mouth. Hey, you were thinking the same thing. You just weren't brave enough to tell her. What good would it do? It's not like she ever listens to us anyway. Well, I'd rather scream it right in her stupid face than be a quiet little mouse. Oh, we forgot the key. We need to put it back. Maybe we could hide it somewhere. You know, for fun. Goblins are supposed to help the princess, not play mean tricks. Whatever, you're not fun. I'm only trying not to make her even worse. Whoa, did that just happen? I don't know, but I saw it too. It felt like it did when we used to share thoughts with our voice. It did, but that was a memory of us 10 years ago, right? I, I vaguely remember it happening. Can you hear me? Ty, we can't do this when we're in the middle of talking to someone. But this is pointless. He's hammered. He's always hammered. And who knows? Maybe it'll make him chatty. Now come on. People think our family is weird enough. Um, everything okay with you two? Yes. No. Oh, all right. Love it. All right, so these fantastical elements, like I said, that's the voice and the bond that you just saw in gameplay. Um, those are a really core part of the story flow um, and yeah, the gameplay. Um, that's that's how you navigate between scenes. What do you think the value of these elements is in telling these two character stories? I mean, I think this is a really interesting way to look at perception uh, and how we view the past. And it kind of kicks off, it kind of like, you know, connects us to the last question is, and, and the realization that his mom was supportive. It's, it's the perception, you know, they didn't have the full picture and, and two people can, can see things differently, even if you're twins. Um, and, uh, and another thing that I really like about the fact that their voice and, and this connection that they had when they were little is, is comes back when they get back together um and something if you don't know is like they they lost the bond um after that night and and tyler went away he was he was uh, kind of shipped off to uh to a treatment facility um and to you know and which really helped him grow but it was it was a moment where they lost their voice and they thought that maybe maybe it didn't really exist anymore and i loved when they came back that they had it again because it really kind of it it confirms the fact that Tyler's still the same person and he still has this beautiful bond with his sister. Um, and that, that, that sibling connection, that twin connection didn't change even though Tyler transitioned. Um, and I feel like that's a really great way to look at their voice. Uh, um, but I also just like that the fact that it, it really does show you like, hey, you know, there, there are two truths and, and normally the one truth kind of lays in the middle of, of how everyone remembers things. Yeah, yeah, um, that's excellent. You know, something you touched on is, uh, and it wasn't shown in that clip, right? But um, sometimes the memories that they have are different and you'll see visualizations of each of their things. You know, they mentioned Rashomon and like, you'll get to sort of collectively decide which memory you're going to go with, um, which I thought was such an interesting part of the story. Um, mm -hmm. It really leads into our next question, right? So much of the story involves this delving into memories from the past, going through it, trying to figure out what the actual facts were. They're trying to uncover things from 10 years ago and they're having to dive into their spotty memories to do it. So how do you talk about a trans person's childhood and their memories sensitively? What's important to touch on or to avoid in a story like this? I when think that it's, go ahead. That I think that, you know, just, just like everyone else, everybody's different which means that everyone's childhood was different. Um, and so when you're talking about 
you know, uh, a trans person as their, their childhood self, that could be two completely different situations. You could have, you know, just going from my own experience, you could have a trans man who was forced to wear dresses and that's not who I was, but like if you, you, you divide it by two different things, you know, as a kid, I was a little boy. I mean, I, I refused to wear dresses. I stole my brother's clothes. I had a short haircut and it was only until I was like 13 that it kind of changed um but then you can have a different a completely opposite situation where the you know the child could feel the exact same way that i did but wasn't given the opportunity to wear those boys clothes or have that short haircut and their childhood could feel a lot different and so when i talk about my childhood gender wasn't something i really thought about um but that's that's because that's my own personal experience so when you're when you're going into talking about a trans person's childhood I think you really have to go off of what they're giving you and 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 not necessarily what you what you want to know because it's 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 personal it's personal and and so when I refer to my past self it's it's normally met with positivity when I between the ages of two to eight but then I think about my teenage years and that's like oh it's tough to think about um, and so I think that it's, it's all about, you know, it's, it's just personal experience. I think my internet's being tough too. It is, but that's okay. We, we, I think we're getting all of your answers. So you're, you're okay, doing great. Good. Thank you. Um, I know we're running a little over. There's one last clip I want to get to, um, specifically like this one doesn't spoil too much, but it's sort of the beginning hints of a queer romance that, uh, sparks between Tyler and another character, Michael. Um, so I would love to play that clip for y'all as well. What's up? I need your opinion on this masterpiece. <laughs> Is that supposed to be me? Yeah, come on, look at the hair. Nailed it, right? Honestly, it's beautiful. Hey, don't make fun of me. I'm not. Oh, well, maybe a little bit, but <laughs> I like it, for real. Well, it helps to have a good model. So, this is what you're up to while I was out there doing your work? What can I say? I'm a multitasker. Hey, multitasker? I think you made a mistake here. Total amount should be 36. Oh, how dare you, sir? What? <laughs> I just don't want you to get in trouble. Yeah, you're right. You know, I'm off my game today. Cool. Um, so it's probably a little hard to tell. That's just like the very, very beginning of, of that romance between Tyler and Michael. Um, but it's it's the part I got butterflies during when I was playing. I was so excited to like, oh, oh, I'm a model. Oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> developing it, you know, developing that romance and that relationship actually involves choices on the part of the player. Um, so what does it mean to you to play through different romance options for a trans character to voice those, those different options? Um, and what experiences did you bring to that piece of the story? I think it's really cool that they gave they gave you different options and they gave you the opportunity to say, you know what, I don't know if I'm quite ready for that. I'm still figuring out who I am. And and that's something that they tell you when you're, you know, uh, when specifically when you're medically transitioning like Tyler did, like the first year can be confusing and to to you know to uh, to to make sure that you're you're putting yourself first. And when it comes to relationships and and learning that, it's it's can be complicated, especially as a trans person. You know, communication is incredibly important in a relationship um, when when you are dating someone of the LGBTQ community and specifically a trans human. Uh, and so, you know, Ty Tyler and Michael are so sweet, and they're they're so they're so. Uh, Michael's, you know, kind of laying it on thick. He's like, "You're cute," and 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 I think Tyler's almost taken aback that he's, you know, enjoying himself. Uh, and it's cool because this is the first experience that Tyler's getting out in the real world and he's got this cute guy hitting on him and he's like, wait a second, I, I like Michael. I think, I think maybe I could, and maybe I'm not ready yet or, or maybe I am and, and this is a safe place. And I think that's one of the most important things is that, is that the tell me why team and the storytellers there really made the Michael relationship a safe place no matter what choice as a player you made moving forward. Yeah, yeah, I uh, definitely got the feeling as I was playing through. 
Um, so thank you so much for for talking a little more about this game. This was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I hope Happy to. <laughs> introduce some new folks to the game as well. Um, so I will now turn it over one last time to the full panel. Thanks, Cooper. Um, let's talk more about the themes of, of Tell Me Why. Um, one great thing about Tell Me Why is that while it touches on difficult emotional topics and there are multiple endings, uh, the game ultimately tells an optimistic story of trans identity in a, a world that is deeply unsafe for trans people. How, how do we tell stories of a hopeful future? Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I can start on this one. Um, the, the general idea is that while the world may be deeply unsafe, there are still safe places and there are still people that love us in the world. And telling stories that exemplify the, the love and communities that we find is a good way to like ground that hope and make it authentic. And one of the things that's important is that it is not just like hate and danger that like surround us on every corner. There, there are, there are people and there are like support for us out there. Uh, a good example are the charities we're raising money for today are support groups focused on uh, trans people just in the world today. It's not just hate and vitriol surrounding people. And so to ground, to ground hope, to ground hopeful stories, focusing on like structures of like love and community are ways to. Yeah, I think and like, you know, touching on that support thing and, and, and not overlooking, you know, specifically with Tell Me Why, which is where I get most of my gaming experience. Sorry, I keep referring to this one thing. But Allison is such a supportive point for Tyler. And, and I think that's something to remember is like having, having a sibling or having a friend, having your chosen family who are, are super supportive and are, are kind of just they don't treat you any different. They're just kind of always there. They, they, and they connect with you and, and they are proud of you is something that is super important when, when coming to finding those supportive moments for trans characters moving forward. Those are both such lovely answers. I feel like from the storytelling perspective, we write the future we want to see, in which case I am pretty hopeful and uh, maybe naively so. <laughs> But I want that to be the future, the future being a safe place for gender, sexuality, body diversity. I want that to be true. And I would love for the stories that we tell to end up focusing on conflict outside of the phobia and the hatred and instead on the beauty, the diversity, the competence, and um, even the power of transness. Well, I think, you know, my next question is sort of underscores a lot of the discussion that we've been having today. And, and I'll say it anyways, because I think it's just important to kind of keep putting this message out there. But why is it important that we tell optimistic stories? And what special value is there in trans people being the ones to tell them? Uh, you know, one one thing that I, I just watched, and, and I, I hadn't watched it until this point, was Boys Don't Cry. I hadn't seen that. And although it was, a, you know, beautifully done and for the time wise, it was, it was really well done. It was also terrifying. I mean, I'm so glad that I didn't watch that pre-transition. I think it would have held me back. And, and so I think that when we're telling positive trans stories, you have to remember that people are watching these stories and they're not just for trans people. Um, and so, you know, it's for, it's for people who, who are like, Try, you know, trying to figure themselves out or trying to connect or trying to, or trying to find that, that common ground. And if you're only telling stories that are filled with trauma and, and uh, uh, transphobia and, and hate and violence, you're really only showing people one way to react to trans people. And so when I when I watched that that show, obviously you know the '90s is a completely different time, and the world was very different then than it is today, where we're in a much queerer light. Our stories really they they've evolved to a certain extent, but they're they're not quite as 
as positive as they could be and, and creating, creating a positive space around trans people, I think will help, you know, the allies of the trans community and, and cis people really, you know, hopefully treat us a little bit differently moving forward. I think we're telling our own stories and we're writing for our own people in many regards. And this is selfish, but in writing trans stories about acceptance, sometimes I'm like writing to myself and to my friends. I'm writing that trans people are loved and supported and that's the significance. We're not falsifying a cis narrative into being trans. We're not thinking about it would be like, we're telling that story. We're writing for the future. And when we take a stand and when we actively represent our culture, our people, our friends, and our family, and the youth we inspire, we make a difference. And that will always be worth framing it optimistically, especially now. We don't need more trauma or death. We need hope. Most definitely. When we tell stories, people tend to believe that the stories we tell are echoes of our reality. And when you hear an echo, you tend to try to imagine what the thing is that made the sound. So while it's very easy to understand that when you tell a story of a knight slaying a dragon, you don't actually imagine a 100 foot lizard being slain by a man in a tin can. You can imagine it's very easy to think that people overcoming very difficult problems is something that happens all the time. And it's something to aspire to. So when we tell stories of negativity or of pain and suffering for trans people, it's easy to extrapolate in the same way that the only thing facing trans people is pain and suffering. When you tell optimistic and positive stories though, even if they're fantastical about adventures through space or in a interesting like magical pop universe, um, you can still extrapolate those back into reality as there is hope and positivity and love and excitement in the future for trans people. Beautifully said. Second that. Thank you. You know, when we're kind of telling stories that include trans characters, I would also kind of love to hear from this group the importance of featuring their identity as a component, as, as y'all mentioned. Um, but what also like exists on the spectrum uh, between like completely unmentioned and the identity is the story. You mentioned a couple of different uh, points on that spectrum. I'd be interested in hearing uh, from this group. I think trans love story. You know, like uh, telling a trans love story, you have to have, you have to touch upon all of the things that come with being with a trans human, which is the communication and, and the boundaries, depending on, on, on where they are, what they, what they identify as and, and, and how fluid they are in their life. And, and so when you're telling a story about trans love, it doesn't have, you don't have to focus on the trans aspect because it's a part of the relationship and it's a you know it's a part of the queerness of of that love but it doesn't make it any less lovable it doesn't it doesn't change their you know the the fact that they're still loved there um and i feel like that's one of something that i i rarely see when it comes to trans representation It, it's hard to pin things on the spectrum between the two ends of completely unmentioned and the identity is the story um, because that's kind of all we have. <laughs> Our stories where the point of the story is being trans, um, to be fair, or it's com completely unmentioned. Um, the, the exceptions are really uh, the, the new things that are butting up and percolating to the surface. And so you can basically put every style of story or every like example or hope we have for the future onto the spectrum, right? Like having a story where it is just an adventure through space where the main character happens to be trans would technically be on that spectrum nearly anywhere. Um, having trans love is on that spectrum. Um, having the next like multiplayer shooter where there are several like trans characters on the cast and it's just one aspect of their personality um, is on, on that spectrum, mostly because the two defining edges of the spectrum are almost all we have to work with at the moment. So it's really hard to define individual things between that spectrum that would like be worth mentioning because 
it encompasses everything that we need to be working on. Yeah, to speak a little bit to kind of like what Zara and August have already said, I think the general principle here is that over the course of a story, getting to know a character, you find out more about them, more about the things that they're inform their personality, their state. And I think that's pretty normal and natural. And while transitioning is a bit life experience, and it's worth mentioning, it's not all there is. That said, sort of to the other end of the spectrum, it's helpful to tell people and be acknowledged for it because it is part of the identity of trans people. And to go back a little bit to what I had said earlier about it being a personal choice in a lot of ways, the importance of it exists for a number of people from cisgender people looking to understand to people who haven't seen this representation before to young people who are looking for guidance, to people just learning about themselves. And it can and should be used as a tool and it's at our discretion to choose when we want to elaborate on it for that purpose. Leaving your final thoughts for the audience, um, would love to kind of hear from this group, you know, what stories do you wanna tell next? And how do you see your personal future in storytelling? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, go ahead. Was that I, for us or for the audience? <laughs> I was confused. <laughs> oh, this is for, 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> for the audience. It was for the audience. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I just, I would like to continue bringing more, more opportunities to showcase trans characters with, with kind of my work on, on events. I, I would say that I have a flair for like building structures to deliver stories and delivering kind of these, these broad, uh, almost theatrical moments to, to players. And I would love to have these be opportunities to show off more characters and more individual like growth stories to be able to do kind of what Rowan was mentioning and getting to know these characters more and more personally and show what makes up their personalities and getting to grow closer and understanding authentically what brings them together and what brings together their personality. To do that, we need more trans characters to put a spotlight onto. So what I would say is what I see in my future is building more stages for trans characters to dance across. But to do that, we need trans characters for which the stage to uh, host. Yeah, I think not only do I want to bring more to trans stories, I want to tell stories about intersectionality. I want to tell stories about disabled gay trans men. I want to tell stories about elder trans non-binary people of color. I want to see all of this create a beautiful tapestry of kind of queer power in the media. And I think personally, I just want to tell a story that helps someone else with their identity. I don't necessarily want to leave a mark. I just want to be able to talk to somebody about this. And if it's meaningful to even one person, then I'll have done my job. Um, I'm gonna butcher this quote from Alan Bennett, I'm sure. But one of the things that he's written is that the best moments are when you come across something, a thought, a feeling, a way of looking at things which you had thought special and particular to you. Now here it is, set down by someone else, a person you have never met. And it as if as it is as if a hand has come out and taken yours. And to think that I might have a profound impact on somebody by telling a story that they relate with, that they're able to relate to, would just be a very meaningful thing, I think, in helping to tell those stories. I love that quote. I, yeah, I think I think that moving forward, it's just all about inclusion and and really opening up inclusion to 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 every type of human out there, and not really just setting our are gauged to to one version of trans and and one version of queer and one version of gay and lesbian and and and, and beating those kind of stereotypes that are, that are already existed is just really by including everybody and and not just to have a trans person there you know it's not like oh we we put a trans person in there we're diverse great awesome it's like you know they're there because they bring something to the story and i think that everyone you know, no matter who they are, bring something to the story and, and creating characters that that are, are there for a reason, not just to like fit and, and, and to, 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 you know, check a box on the diversity. 
And so for me, it's really just about, you know, uh, opening up and, and not having a box in general. It's like, let's just, let's just include everybody so that, so that, you know, any, anyone out there who doesn't feel like they might be included and doesn't see themselves does. Cause that's important. I, I didn't really see any trans people on, on TV until, I don't know, five years ago, maybe just didn't and definitely not in a positive light. Well, you know, August, Rowan, Zara, this has been phenomenal. And thank you so much for, for bringing yourselves and your thoughts and your insights to the table. Now is the time to, to bring in questions from, from um, the viewing audience. So we're going to be pulling questions from the chat on the It Gets Better Project's Twitch page. So if you want to ask one of our panelists a question, go ahead and submit it, and we'll get to as many as we can. So, uh, Jessica, this this looks like a good one for you to share. Should I just ask it? Oh, you're muted. Well, I am back. Um, yeah, I'll read, read out the first question, and um, I, I think there's a few perspectives in this group that I can also answer aspects of this question too. So first one's from Limit Testers, how much the international level of League of Legends affects the ability to share LGBTQI plus identities and stories, cinematics and characters, etc. Um, I'm happy to take a stab at this, but um, does anyone on the panel want to take a stab first? I can also give it a give it a go to. Okay, <laughs> um, so you know, obviously, you know, we we shared a, a a a couple of ways that we've kind of built up our capability and kind of not just um, releasing content um, in 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 the spectrum of identity, but um, also how do we how do we ensure we're telling authentic stories that are that are very empathetic to the experience of that on on that spectrum. Um, you know, I, I think on the it, on the side of wanting to tell those stories internationally, that has been um, the world has been changing over the years, and and so understanding where where people kind of um, understand, you know, from a government perspective, like how how that is going to be. Um, received on on players ends I, I think different regions have had different perspectives on it but the world is changing and I, and I think that you know for us we we've been trying to kind of navigate and understand and, and equip our teams to really um, be on that brave side of being able to tell these stories and, and I think while that has been um, a I think a, a hard and and um, sometimes painful journey um, I, I do think what is you know, what we're facing right now is is no longer going to be, you know, just around, um, you know, I've, I've read some of the chat comments about like, hey, like, is, is this the friction point that's going to be the make or break of us telling some of these stories? And and really, it's not, it's not that. It's going to be us telling the right stories um, and telling them in the right way. And and I think that's going to be the most important thing that this panel is kind of um, kind of highlighted is. Is that we do that respectfully and and with care. And so, um, while we're always going to be thinking about, you know, what how how players kind of receive these stories, really, it's going to be about the the execution of that so much more than 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 international borders. I think that's such a great answer, Jessica. And if I can pop in really quickly, just to say that, like days like today where we're celebrating publicly and days where we kind of like interact with our audience, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much that goes on internally and so much good work that people are doing within the company to make sure that these stories are upheld universally and globally. That is really important to be able to at least, I guess, hopefully hear it from us today. Like this is an effort that we're consistently making and we're, we're doing our very, very best to bring these stories to everyone. 
Yeah, 100%. Uh, sweet. Uh, oh, go for it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just got, did you want to? No, 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 go for it. Okay. Like, maybe we can uh, take turns. <laughs> huh? Okay, we'll, we'll go back and forth. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, um, so uh, Thousand Eyes is, this is for you, August. Uh, so Thousand Eyes is curious about how much input you had in your character. Uh, tell me why. Um, I had, you know, a, a solid amount of say. And, and, and I want to give the tell me why and the don't not team just as much credit as possible because I I didn't know what kind of character I was stepping into and and when you do when you are a trans actor and you are walking into a character you're not really sure what to expect and for the most part I didn't really have like these big red flags or these moments where I felt like you know they didn't take the time or the energy to really to really I don't know flush out this character to make sure that they were doing the right thing but in the moments that there was very sensitive uh, topics and there was um, moments that really could be taken the wrong way, my opinion was asked first. It was like, hey, how do you feel about this? Um, do, would you change it? Would you change the verbiage? And a lot of times if I was like, you know what, I would never say that. They were like, okay, cool. Now, what would you say? Um, and, how, and how would this make you feel if we said it this way? And so it was really like, it was great communication. And I think that was, uh, it was a surprise, but it was, it was a beautiful surprise because it was, it was just an incredible experience working with a team that wanted the best for this character. Nice and uh, encouraging <laughs> to hear that. Very cool. I'll read the next question. So this is from Lawscribe. Do you think focusing on the sex or sexuality of a character so much that it seems to be their only character trait is ultimately harmful when the point of the character seems to be inclusiveness, yet they seem to be constantly pointed out as different from the main character or others? I think this is a question that um, this group can really yeah. share perspectives on. Uh, so uh, I have an opinion on this. And this, this seems to be kind of pointing at like tokenism where the the character seems to be like shallow or hollow beyond a single point um they, they even go as far as to say their their only character trait um and i believe that that's actually the the core point we're looking at is to have more representation as fully three-dimensional characters um people who are more than just their gender expression or more than just their sexuality uh, we're, we're not looking for tokenism. We're not looking to check boxes and we shouldn't be advocating for games or media to, to do that just to like hit some arbitrary checklist and move on. We're looking for to tell stories or include characters that are authentic and believably well-rounded, right? Um, one of the reasons that we can get to characters that are air quotes normal or believable is because a lot of their expression or identity or sexuality is so commonly ingrained in media or commonly ingrained in culture that it's not second guessed. And if being transgender were as commonly ingrained in media and culture as that were, it wouldn't even be a question. It wouldn't need to be a point of being inclusive to the point of tokenism. So no, I don't believe anybody is looking to advocate for tokenism. That is backsliding or negative representation. August, are you um, muted? muted. <laughs> Again, uh, yeah, it's like about breaking the, the stereotype of, of a token trans character, or token token representation for any any you know diversity, any minority is is uh, you don't want that you want to move away from that because that's really you know the perception of what that person should be from people who don't understand and so you know including trans people in the representation hi Ru, um is really you're 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 defeating that because you're you're not going to get a token representation from a trans person. You're like, oh no, I fit all these stereotypes. That's not ever going to come from someone. But if you talk to someone who doesn't know a trans person, they're going to just refer to everything they've seen. Um, and that's, so I, I agree with Zara. It's really about if you're really thinking that people are going to go for a token representation, that you're, you're backsliding.
Um, we have another question from uh, Vanessa Lope. Uh, as a trans gamer, I uh, experienced a lot of harassment from the gamer community. Is Riot committed to fighting transphobia and other forms of LGBT phobia? Um, it is important for trans people to hear clearly and explicitly from the headquarters that, um, that they are not only against hate, but also fight it in some way. I guess that's Is that I can at least this is a broad question. So um, I, I think, you know, when we're thinking about, so there's a couple of different vectors and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll talk through a couple of them. So one is, you know, um, the, the like in-game chat, like player interactions within game um, and, and to what degree do our systems currently identify and, and, and manage and, and um, player interactions such that such, such that we're, we're, we're catching this. I think this is true for both the you know you know text-based chat and voice chat. And I think from one from I, I, I don't know how much um, you know we've covered this on the voice chat side, but um, we will we will be giving more updates on that. Um, we're basically trying to really invest time in, in how we um, identify player communication um, and manage this um, systemically so that um, we're not trying to grab it from, you know, specific player support tickets. In addition to that, we will, but we also want to make it more of an inclusive culture where the environment that you're in is is already managed such that you're you're not running into that situation from day to day. And so that that's that's one aspect of this that I think we, we want to be mindful of. And because ultimately, you know, the environment in game is going to be what you kind of interface with most often. The second part of that is um, uh, like, you know, times in the year like this when we're kind of discussing, you know, are the importance of, of how we're kind of thinking about this from a value standpoint um, and, and kind of increasing our level of education and our capability to kind of empathize um, on the identity spectrum. And, and I think that's something where we can't just go into work like that without educating ourselves and, and, and really also increasing awareness. And so that's a second aspect that I think we want to kind of invest in. Um, you know, thirdly, there's a lot of game companies that are, are just starting to learn. And, and it is, we are very early in our, um, in our education process to kind of understand how we can get better at this. Um, but we are talking to, you know, different, different folks in the industry, different companies in the industry who are also trying to collectively get better. Um, and I think that's something that as we kind of share learnings about how people kind of um, work to discourage this behavior and in what ways we'll also be able to kind of take us practices and learnings to be able to kind of uh, reincorporate them to how Riot works as well. Yeah, I don't want to necessarily jump on this as someone who's an expert either in customer service or in UI UX or in building the systems that kind of like ban people from the game or anything like that. But I can tell you internally, yes, absolutely. We're committed to that every single day. We don't want any of our gamers to experience harassment, not in any of the games that we have. And there is constant movement towards building better systems to prevent that kind of harassment from happening in the future. And again, I can really only talk about it from the narrative side of things because that's what I'm most commonly involved with. But I can tell you that this is an endeavor that people are definitely committed to within the company. I will ask, ask the last question from Jess Gobbles. Um, what are your thoughts of overcoming the barrier to diversity when the tops of gaming industry are usually cis white men? And at times they have shown themselves as being less than accepting. Also a broad question. Sorry, could you ask that again? <laughs> yes. Uh, what are your thoughts of overcoming the barrier to diversity when the tops of gaming industry are usually cis het white men and at times they have shown themselves as being less than accepting? And I can approach this at least from um, a team representation standpoint. You know, I, I think we don't want to, you know, it, it's something where 
we don't talk about it often, but but actually our our game, both like two of our big games at Riot Games are led by women. Um, I I think you know representation is about getting getting also the teams to be also more inclusive and more diverse. Um, and, and I don't and I think that can that can be the case at, at all levels of leadership, not not just specific teams or team compositions. Um, and that's something that I think we want to you know. We're, we're investing time in and I think that that's becoming more clear on the on the leadership side but it's still there's so much work to be done here um, but the the kind of like you know this this truth of hey the tops of gaming industry will always be cis hat white men I, I hope that actually we, we make progress towards that not being the case that uh, we have diversity in our leadership and we have diversity in how we how we lead gaming efforts and but, but yeah, I don't know if others want to add on to this, but yeah. The only real thing I have to add is that overcoming a lot of those barriers and accepting and getting like work or getting representation through when it comes to content is often just like persistence, at least in the field of design or in the field of getting like a lot of content like this published or trying to get things into the wild. It's persistence and trying to get it out the door if it's not getting it greenlit by somebody who isn't inherently accepting it's doing it yourself and if it's not getting it greenlit the first time it's trying to get it greenlit the second time it's trying to get that general broad sense of empathy built over time from that sense of like persistence and tenacity that uh that we've been talking about for most of today so it's sticking to what we're strong at. <laughs> okay, um, we we are at the end of our stream, everyone. Um, once again, want to give a huge thank you to all of the panelists. This was incredibly insightful, and we're so grateful to all of you for giving us your time and and sharing your lives with us. Uh, we also want to give a huge shout out to everyone who stuck around with us to watch the panel. Uh, hopefully you heard some things that resonated with you and have empowered you to tell your own story. And as we mentioned at the top, um, visit visibility will only get the trans community so far. For allies, it's vital that we translate it into educating our peers, supporting trans rights and equality, and providing material support for trans people. Thank you as well to everyone who donated to the OCA project and gate uh, on top of the $5,000 given by rainbow rioters you all raised an additional $3,000 um, that's incredible so thank you. Um, and however the fundraiser is actually not in fact over yet uh, now that the panel is done we'll be actually doing a raid on Annie a professional Valorant player for cloud nine. So for the next few hours, she's going to be hosting an amazing stream and continuing to raise money for these two charities. She's an incredible player and we hope you'll stick around to watch. So you don't need to leave the channel either. We'll send you over there automatically. And so happy Trans Day of Visibility, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.